Welcome to Next in Tech, an S&P Global Market Intelligence podcast where the world of emerging tech lives. I'm your host, Eric Hanselman, Chief Analyst for Technology, Media, and Telecom at S&P Global Market Intelligence. And today, we're going to be talking about what it takes to scale artificial intelligence and machine learning with returning guest, Nick Patience, who's Managing Analyst for Data, AI, InfoSec, and Risk. Uh, Nick, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Eric. It's good to be back. And it is great to have you because not only are we digging into a subject that we've touched lightly on, I think, before, but this is also something you're going to be talking about at the 451 Nexus conference. Uh, you've got a session that's talking about scaling AI. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And that's, so we're going to sort of talk, examine some of the subjects, examine what it kind of means to be actually scaling AI and some of the tools and, and techniques that organizations are uh, employing to do that. Well, you know, this is something that, as I said, we, we've touched on in the past, but we think about what's really happened with the artificial intelligence and machine learning. You know, organizations are getting into this next phase. They've gone from that sort of dabbling in it, trying to figure out what's going on, to now actually running business processes on top of it. And, and that means they're having to take what was those early stage operations uh, and bring them up into full production scale. Um, and that's not as straightforward as, as one might seem. Uh, what are the kinds of things that they're having to wrestle with? Yeah, that's right. It isn't, it isn't as, as straightforward as it, as it might seem. I mean, just to start with, partly because AI and machine learning is a different um, way of you know, writing and deploying software than you know, we've gone before. So we've obviously gone for decades with uh, essentially rules-based software. And so humans write the rules, the software follows the rules and executes functions within, within the applications. And then when you want to do something different, the humans come back and, and change those rules. And obviously, the key difference between that and uh, machine learning is that the, the models uh, that are deployed learn from new data that comes through, and they change and they adapt uh, essentially by themselves. And that means they, uh, they need to be monitored um, and managed to make sure that they're still actually making predictions that make sense in the context of whatever application it is. So it presents a, yes, a fundamentally, yes, it's, a, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a shift. Um, and, and so we, you know, we see organizations uh, wrestling initially with that concept, um, but then once you're deploying, then there's, there's, a whole, there's other issues um, that, uh, you know, you, that you have to think about. So I guess one of the things that would be interesting to talk about is you know, what does it mean to be scaling AI? And I don't mean that in a kind of esoteric sense, but what are the actual, the actual challenges? So we found um, actually in our research, our latest uh, Voice of the Enterprise AI Machine Learning Infrastructure Survey uh, just one, yeah, a couple of little data points I'll just throw at you. So the um, compared to the year ago survey, we found that the average number of models in production has grown by seventy three percent in the in the past um, twelve months. Um, and so we got an average figure at the moment of the people who respond to just under three and a half thousand models in production. Now I was, you know, talking to organisations, you know, four or five years ago, and they had five, ten, fifteen models, and so. You know, you can see yeah you know, those numbers are, are quite different from three and a half thousand yeah just a little bit <laughs> a little bit yeah so yeah what you know kind of I guess it's worth asking what does that actually mean um and and what what yeah you know, what problems does that does that throw up essentially yeah as I said earlier the the issue that models change and and over time you based on data means you need to essentially check in on those models to make sure they're they're still working properly so that's a that's a kind of key challenge we find organizations facing. Well, and managing you know, what was that process, I guess when a lot of organizations sort of headed into sort of AI and ML environments, there was that idea that you do the training, the inference up front, and then you deploy the model, and then it would give you results. Uh, but yet, you know, the whole point, as you've identified, is that, that that model needs to continue to learn and grow. Uh, but you've also got to ensure that it continues to be valid, that it's continuing to produce valid results. There's a lot of that sort of reproofing that's taking place, the validation that's happening. Um, it seems like that creates, when you start getting it up into you know, the very large numbers of models that are around, that winds up being a whole maintenance process into and of itself. Yeah, that's right. It's a kind of new, essentially a new era of software um, where you, you're looking, if you go back to the um, something like the application performance management space of a decade ago or something like that, uh, a whole sector of software cropped up 
to essentially manage something else. Um, and I think we're seeing the same thing uh, now. And so, you know, here it's the, yeah, the space is called uh, ML Ops. Um, and there's a related field, field called AI governance, but but the ML Ops stuff is very much that, um, you know, managing the performance, um, monitoring the performance, um, and, you know, effectively, you know, scheduling retraining of, of models um, over certain periods of time, uh, you know, that, that the organizations need to do because obviously you can't, you can't do it essentially by hand when you've got thousands of models or, or you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. Um, and so we see that kind of, you know, a new sector of the software industry uh, cropping up. And that's something we're, gonna, we're definitely going to talk about at 451 Nexus. Well, I mean, ML Ops really seems is a, a, a I was going to say a different kind of automation, but uh, well, I don't know. Maybe is it a different kind of automation? It seems like you're having to shift the way in which we think about automation from doing things like managing basic configuration, uh, deployment kinds of issues, to now being something that really is much more tightly bound into the actual process itself. Yeah, that's right. It is. It is essentially a set of processes. Um, you know, the the data comes in one end. Um, and a prediction comes out the other end, and you're you're obviously hoping that those predictions you know continue to make sense. These models are embedded in software, and they are a key part of what drives whatever the process is that 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 software is trying to achieve. Uh, so yeah, you know I I totally agree with that. I, I guess you know I look at traditional software processes, and you know you've got unit test, and, and what you're really doing is you're proving out what are the rules that you've built into the software. Um, it seems like with you know, AI and ML environments, you've got something that's much more adaptive. Um, is this something where you're revalidating training sets? Um, how does that get tackled? Yeah, it is. It is that is a, that is a key part of it. Um, the you know the, the revalidating of training sets, um, and I guess it's it's you know it depends on you know what you're trying to do in terms of um, you know whether this needs to be you know, real time or near real time or. Or, or batch that's certainly uh, a key element of it um and then obviously if the if the data has uh, you know is, is, if there's you know bias or there's anything else that's crept into the data or crept into the model um and there always is some sort of um bias going on um whether we whether we like it or not um yeah that can cause organizations to to do some retraining I and mean, we found actually um actually in the in the same survey i just mentioned the so voice of the enterprise ai machine learning infrastructure survey um, we found, I think, the largest um, largest cohort of organizations uh, in terms of the, the frequency of their training was monthly or retraining was monthly. I think we found 18% said um, monthly, 17% said daily, 14% said within minutes, uh, 9% said within seconds. Um, and then there's out there's like only 2% said yearly, you know, so it's kind of you can see which way which way things are going. And then. Um, another aspect to to think about is yes, yeah, we mentioned the number of models. Models themselves are obviously they're not they're not massive databases. They're very small bits of software. Um, but there's there's other things that are driving all this. Obviously, which is the data, um, and then the networks and the storage and everything that goes with it. And those things are you know uh, do put burdens on organisations. We found um, relating to the retraining, fifty six percent of organisations said their infrastructure limitations were actually preventing them from retraining uh, as often as they would like. And so you see a kind of you know a real a real issue there, and you know not everybody needs real time, far from it. Um, but but there is a there is a desire to certainly make sure the model is working off the latest data and is making sense of that data and, and sending out predictions that actually uh, you know what the original intention of the of the application was. So when we think about some of the infrastructure limitations, I mean, what are the kinds of things that the people are running into? I mean, I, I know we talked in the past about challenges with access to data. And, and ensuring that you have the, the data that you need where you need it, and that data distribution becomes a, a, a significant limitation. Is that mostly a networking issue? Is it something where data distribution becomes more of the problem? Which aspects are, are things that people are struggling with? Yeah, we find generally speaking the the data availability or data the data is abundant. Access is the challenge essentially. Um, so, so we, you know, we you know, water, we found, water everywhere, and not a drop to drink. Exactly, exactly. So we found in that survey, um, yeah, ninety percent of enterprises have you know just enough or more that more data than they need for the AI and ML projects. So that's kind of you know it's taken care of. They have they have they have the data. Um, I mean, sometimes I dispute some of that because obviously uh, you, you, that doesn't get into the the nuance of is this well labeled 
um, data? Is this got decent metadata around it, or yeah, is it just is, is it actually usable? Can you yeah. put it to work? Do you know enough about it? Uh, and and you know we, we can get into the whole process of you know all of the data conditioning that's necessary. But yeah, yeah. But then we also found in the same in the same cohort of, of people we spoke to, sixty five percent of of organizations had difficulty accessing the data. So they knew it was out there. Um, they just couldn't get their their hands on it for for the purposes of of building and training uh, and deploying their their machine learning. And so you know that's a that's a key um, a key problem. And you know it may always be. And then, but we also asked them, um, yeah, but what would you do? To your with your infrastructure resources to improve the performance, and I think as we said before, you know, yeah, the, the number one is high performance networking. I think last year it was number two, and the year before that was number one, and this year it's number one. So it's it's pretty clear um, that networking is a major issue. And as we know, why is that? That's because you're moving data around, and that's what that's what takes up a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the issues. And that was clearly the number one. Um, number one pick for for organizations we found in terms of how they would improve things and the second and third were more scalable high performance storage and then accelerators in the cloud so cloud based accelerators uh, specifically um yeah for for training and uh, for inference but mainly but mainly for training so there's definitely some some things that people can do um but it's uh, you know it does a lot of it does come back down to the data you know how much you have to move it around and how fast you can how fast you can do that well, that's one of those things that you know, it's a limitation we keep running up against over and over again. People sort of think, hey, you know, we've got all of this data, we've got connectivity, but it takes time to move bits around. You know, it costs money to move bits around. You know, this is stuff where now that starts to be that, that limiting constraint. Um, it was interesting that uh, accelerators were, were a limitation. You know, I'm assuming that that's you know getting into you know, whatever the you know choose your particular accelerator uh, availability you know, within cloudy environments because the data is actually there. Is that sort of what that's hinting at? I think it also talks about um, yeah. You know, without getting into a pricing discussion, it also talks about cost. Um, it's certainly availability of in certain certain circumstances depending on your the scale of the workload you're trying to train. Um, but um, you know, not everybody can afford uh, cloud-based accelerators, and so you know, yeah, you know, we, we also and we also asked them about on-premises um, accelerators, and that was about halfway down the list. So people, yeah, you know, these are kind of this is a desired list. Yeah, what would you do if you could? Uh, you know, what would you do? You know, what kind of mm. resources would you pick to improve the performance? And so, um, yeah, accelerators have been there. Um, you know, have been in top, you know, top or second or third every time we've asked this kind of question. Ah, okay. So this is something where certainly there's capacity, but the cost of instances that have got accelerators in the cloud winds up being a limiting factor. Yeah, totally. I mean, when you look at something like um, in in the area of natural language processing, these large language models, um, which have come around. So Google kind of came up with the, the idea a few years ago, and then you see lots of other organizations like OpenAI um, and Microsoft and, and yeah, lots of other specialists doing these things, they, are, they are, take up massive amounts of compute resources. And so they're one of these things that you know, if organizations want to do that, um, they are going to need a lot of access to probably cloud-based accelerators, and maybe on-prem as well, depending on what the kind of thing they're doing. Um, so there's only so many organizations who can really afford to do those kinds of things. That's probably an extreme example because you know, that's not for everybody. We're not everybody needs those kinds of things yet. Um, but but for those that do, you know, it can take up a you know a huge amount of uh, compute resources and storage and and networking. So for things like natural language processing, is that something where most of that processing work is done up front at the training stage, or or is this you're still going to need a lot of computational resources when you're actually doing uh, NLP work? You know, with uh, whatever the corpus is you're you're trying to recognize against. Yeah, I think that is mainly mainly up front at the at the training stage. So we're seeing organizations, um, some organizations on the research side and others, you know, training on on, on massive corpuses from the web. Um, so yeah, you can imagine, uh, you know, the amount of work that does to both in input it and to and to filter it and make sure you're getting what you need and the right language and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that is a yeah that is a more of an uh, an upfront exercise. And then we see. Um, on a kind of the other way around, we do see this uh, desire for more and more real time inference, and that's that's the other way around. So that's where the yeah you know, the strain, as it were, on infrastructure will happen at the inference point, at the point where the predictions are made. 
Um, and so, you know, we, we find a, a lot of organizations wanting to do it. But for instance, we find, I think it was 67% of those in retail who we, who we survey said, you know, data locality prevents them from doing that. So you can imagine, obviously, if you've got, you know, 200 stores around the US and, you know, they're spread right across the country, um, you know, it was then unlikely to be doing real-time inference on the data that, app, that is actually stored in the store, as it were. So you can see the, those limitations. So, no, it's an interesting point about that. Is the work done up front? Is the work done at the other at the other end? And it's the answer is yeah. It, it really depends on the on the use case. Got it. Well, which, which brings me to ideas around the value of the model themselves. Because you know, let's say you've got a big NLP model. Um, this is something where there's been a significant investment in computational power. You know, to create the model, to train it, to get it to this point. The model itself starts to become the really valuable piece of this entire puzzle. Uh, and, and that then starts to get into some tricky issues about how do you manage, protect, uh, deal with that model? And, and how are you, are, are you able to, to get it out into the wild on its own? Um, do you have to protect it? Do you have to wrap it? How do you have to deal with it? It's, uh, yeah. We've been looking at some of this stuff in confidential computing stuff. That's an aspect that I think is really fascinating, the idea that you know, it's now we're, we're, you know, we, we've come from a day in which protecting the source code was, was the key piece. Now, you know, again, to your point, we've now got a very different model uh, in which <laughs> a, a different model about the model uh, that the model themselves and the way in which it's been trained and all that inference information starts to become that really valuable element. Totally. It becomes a, um, you know, a valuable piece of IP, essentially. And so and sometimes that will depend on whether the model is based on a pre-trained model, which you may have either licensed from a commercial vendor or got from an open source source, as it were, or you've gone from scratch. Um, and we're actually doing some more survey work now, which will come out uh, in the new year about you know, asking organizations uh, where they, you know, how, how much they depend on pre-trained models um, versus their own custom work. Because you can think of if you just want, um, you know, yeah, you know, let's. I'm not going to say pictures of cats because that's too obvious. But if you just want pictures of, <laughs> let's say, laptops, you know, there's pl plenty of models that have been trained um, around, you know, pictures of laptops. That doesn't really. You don't need. If you don't need any particular um, added value on that, then you know, it doesn't make sense for you to start, start you know, importing a hundred thousand images of various laptops and training your own model. You can get that from the cloud vendors or you know, and from open source. But if obviously you're doing something peculiar uh, and unusual or secret. Um, yeah, and or something you really don't want other people to 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 know that you're doing, um, yeah, for commercial reasons. Then they're going to do a lot of custom model building, and say so that can become incredibly, um, incredibly resource in intensive. So I'm just looking for ring-tailed lemurs. There may not be a model readily available, and you've got to train it up. And when you build it for that particular community, hey, it's got a lot of value. Yeah, that's a much more interesting example than my my one of laptops, but it's exactly the same point. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I'm good at coming up with sort of random animals and here and there, you know, it's a podcast host specialty. So, <laughs> uh, but you know, the other thing that uh, we've been talking about some of the security perspectives when we start getting into confidential computing is, is then once you've got that valuable model of uh, being able to then ensure that you've got, uh, you can turn it loose because, you know, even if you've, if it's open source, Hey, it's easy to get to. But if you've built it, now you've got to think about where it executes. And, and we've been talking with some clients about you know, being able, their concerns about taking models out to edge environments. So doing something that's a very valuable uh, detection uh, with uh, a particular model, but, and they want to be able to, to get it out and license it and have people use it. But their concern is that when it gets out, you know, out more broadly distributed, it's now that much more uh, available for, for pilfering. People can copy it. People can make off with it. Um, and now you've got that IP that is, it's much easier for it to, to wander off into places where you're not able to monetize it anymore. That's a really interesting point. And it's certainly something we expect to see a lot more of. So we, um, in, in, this, in the, our latest survey, 95% of organizations said they would prefer to do um, more training or more inference or both at the edge. So that's basically everybody. Um, but currently only 11% are using the edge as a primary venue for training models and only 12% using it as their primary inference. So it doesn't mean then 
they yeah that's the primary one so not yeah they're doing inference in various places and then yeah why we also say yeah why is that um and physical security is is a big part of it uh, storage capacity is another part of it uh, compute performances but you're right there's also this whole idea of um you know ai governance and auditability and you know who's you know yeah you know, when was this model trained by whom when was it last retrained how many times have it been retrained um all those kinds of things and then um, and then, as you say, literally, you know, are these models um, safe, or can they be, you know, can they be altered in any way um, beyond your control? And that's uh, as ever, security looms large in everything you know that we that we see, especially in whenever a new way of doing something comes along that has a lot of perceived value, um, such as AI in general. I'm talking about, um, you know, a lot of people are going to be look for, let's just say, nefarious opportunities. Well, uh, you talked about checking for bias. And I mean, we could probably do an entire episode uh, on auditability. And you know, the, the challenge is that when you get to the edge, uh, the things that you're typically doing at the edge are those things that are closer to you know the humans in the world. And there are a whole bunch of those aspects of ensuring that the models that are operating at the edge are, are operating well, uh, or at least do, <laughs> operating is intended. And, and that's also the place where you start to get into the kinetic world of having models controlling physical things. You, you've now got cars, robots, uh, that whole set of aspects that are, are interacting with the world in, in the kinetic sphere. And, and that means that you, know, if you want to be that much more careful about ensuring that they're working well, they're doing what you intend, uh, really you know, operating you know, much more specifically. And yet, you're about, you've got a bunch of constraints that make it complicated to figure out how well they're performing. Yeah, and I guess this, I mean, kind of uh, that sums up, well, it doesn't sum up, it's one other aspect of all these issues we've been talking about um, today, about you know, the challenges of getting AI to scale. So you could be, um, you know, it's one thing to be doing it, let's say, entirely within a single cloud environment. Uh, but as most organizations, as we know, don't operate in a single cloud environment. Uh, and then you have all the other aspects around um, the edge and the near edge and all these other things. These are all scaling issues. It's not just about who has um, who has the most models or who has the most data. It is a kind of you know you could have you know a lot of a lot of edge environments as you say if you work in you know, oil and gas and things like that in some dangerous places around the world. You have lots and lots of um, you know models making decisions close to critical infrastructure. And that's a scaling issue. It's just a different kind of one than if you operated within a you know, a large bank and you had your data center in the basement. And so it's you know there's lots of these um, lots of new problems that have been uh, thrown up. And uh, one one of the things we're going to look at on the in four five one nexus now and our panel discussion is obviously how organisations um, can deal with some of those problems and um, and and make sure they can get their AI to to continue to scale. And we have indeed come full circle <laughs> for back to scaling and, and ML ops uh, right from where we started. Uh, and of course, uh, 451 Nexus. Hopefully our listeners have heard 451 Nexus uh, is back in its virtual form, kicking off October 31st. Uh, there is a link in the show notes uh, to point you to the conference itself. Uh, we hope you can be there live to hear it actually uh, when it's when it's running, but you can also come back in. It will be recorded. You can come back in and check out all the content. Uh, a whole set of different sessions and conferences. Uh, if you go a couple episodes back, Melanie Posey was talking about everything that we're going to be talking about in various forms, including scaling AI. Uh, so, Nick, thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to hearing the deep dive that you'll be doing at 451 Nexus. Great. Thank you, Eric. And just let everybody know, yeah, the live um, live session will be on Tuesday, November the 1st at, uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern. So, and as I say, we can always listen to the recording afterwards. Oh, well, and in fact, actually, there are going to be some overlapping sessions. So you'll have your pick of the things that are interesting to you, and you can come back and catch the ones that you happen to miss. So I uh, hope that we will see you all there. Well, thanks, Nick. This has been great. Uh, maybe I'll have to take a uh, rain check on an auditability uh, episode as we head into the new year. Yep, that sounds like a good subject to come back to. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to our audience. And that is it for this episode of Next in Tech. Uh, thanks for staying with us. And thanks to our production team, including Carolyn Wright and Ethan Zimmon on the marketing and events teams, and our studio lead, Kyle Candy-Losey. 
I hope you'll join us for our next episode where we're going to be digging into a whole set of topics about what's taking place uh, on COP27, uh, ESG issues, a range of different things that we'll be digging into. So I hope you'll join us then because there is always something next in tech.